Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our eighth meeting of John Wooden's Playbook for Life and Leadership. Today, we're going to be talking about initiative and intentness. You're going to hear from Coach Wooden on why the dynamic duo of initiative and intentness are critical in your journey to success. It's with initiative that you shed the fear of failure. It's with intentness that gives you the stamina and the determination to execute the other traits properly over the long haul in the face of adversity. You'll be fueled by Coach Wooden for your future, irrespective of what roadblocks come up after listening to today's session. So with us today, my co-host is Craig Impleman, um, Coach Imp, um, as he's known as, uh, of course, is a Wooden family member, is the author of Wooden Wisdom, and is bringing the wooden ways and insights on leadership um, to corporate America for many years now. We're very, very lucky uh, to have Craig with us today. And with that, Coach Implement, I will turn it over to you. Chris, thank you. Although you only had a choice to say nice things about me, so I'll take it with a grain of salt. Welcome to the eighth meeting, Coach Wins Playbook for Life and Leadership. I know we have some new folks on today. Let's do a quick review. In our first meeting, up in that top right-hand corner, we learned to understand Coach Wood's definition of success, the peace of mind that comes from making your best effort. And then the pyramid of success, the 15 qualities you need to make your best effort. We started out with the cornerstones in the first two months. The first was industriousness. You have to work hard and plan well to get worthwhile results. Enthusiasm, you gotta have a positive attitude, not only for yourself, but everybody else around you to get them at the top of their game. Then we went to the rest of the base of the pyramid, three important qualities, friendship, loyalty, cooperation. Those qualities allow you to get along well with others. Without them, you're just, a, I shouldn't say you're just a talented derelict, but that would kind of be the truth because you've got to have that whole foundation together. Once we got that in place, we moved up to the second tier. And Coach Wooden now says, hey, that's not enough. You got to have self-control. You have to have emotional balance. You have to have self-discipline to be at the top of your game. I'm exhausted already. And then Coach Wooden says, oh, no, we're not done with our best effort yet. It's going to require alertness. You're going to have to be open-minded, eager to learn and improve constantly all the time. And now we go to initiative. And very interesting transition from alertness to initiative, because in initiative, we're asking you to cultivate the ability to think alone. Wait a minute, coach. Last week, you're talking about being open-minded. Okay, here's the way it works. With self-control, you're now open-minded. You're learning everything you can from everybody, right? Reading, studying, got all these great ideas. And now you have to be able to think alone. So you've taken the ideas from everybody else and you're going to make a decision. That's what initiative is. Coach Wooden, take it away. The next block is initiative. Gracious sakes, don't be afraid to fail. We're all imperfect, and we are going to fail on occasions. But the greatest failure of all is failure to act when action is needed. Act using maintaining self-control and use the information that you've acquired in the past in regard to the particular situation that requires action. But act without fear of failure, because you will fail at times. And learn. Don't 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 make the same mistake over and over again. Coach Chris, your thoughts, please. You know, it's interesting because I think so much that this speaks to not letting perfection get in the way of action. If a situation is actionable, you can never have perfect information, but too many opportunities will simply dissipate if you wait for perfect information and a perfect situation. Coach Chris, that's a fantastic uh way of looking at it, not overanalyzing, taking action. So a couple fundamentals about the ability to make decisions. The first fundamental that you need to have is to understand you can't please everybody. 
Coach Wooden with a fantastic video with a lot of humor talking about how you can't please everyone. Coach Wooden. Please, to please everybody, gracious sakes, no, you can't do that. Gracious sakes, we had undefeated se- I had four undefeated seasons, but we didn't win each game by the margin that some of our, play- <laughs> of our alumni thought. And they want to know why. <laughs> Last game I ever taught at uh, San Diego in 1975 when we, we uh, overcome uh, Kentucky for the national championship, one of our very, very wonderful alumnus, he's a great person, oh, he, he donates heavily to every area of the university, not just, not just athletics, oh, every, oh, great, oh, great fellow, great fellow. He's so happy that we won. He, he came down, he put his arms around me, he said, we did it, we did it. You let us down last year, but we got him this year. <laughs> We didn't win the championship the year before. We had we lost uh, North Carolina State, the the the, the uh, team that had lost only one game in the entire year, and we lost to them in a double overtime. And um, we had won seven years of succession before that, and nine out of ten. But he wasn't talking about those. He had talked last year, so we let him down. <laughs> so don't don't try to appease everybody. You you just do the best you can. Coach Chris, your thoughts. Craig, it takes courage to lead. And so having a decision-making process that has integrity will provide a basis for you to be able to explain your decisions. People may not agree with you, but they will at least understand what your process was. Thank that, Coach Chris, that idea of uh, transparency and being able to disagree agreeably and people being able to trust you that you just brought up is a key component of what Coach Wooden's trying to say. Thank you for that. The second part of the definition, don't be afraid of failure, but learn from it. If you want to, well, one of Coach Wooden's favorite quotes, a mistake is valuable if you do four things with it. Recognize it, admit it, learn from it, and forget it. Coach Wooden, talk to us about that idea. Hi, Coach. Um, watching the Olympics and especially the ice skaters, they're, they're committed to excellence and they get out there and they want to do well. And then seeing someone fall and then how they get up graciously and continue the program. And I'm wondering, what is it you do to coach, counsel, train, to influence someone to have that type of character and, and fortitude and strength to continue on once there's a failure, they want to win and yet to accept that defeat. Well, there's a lot of truth in the, in the statement that I'm sure you've all heard. It's no disgrace to fall down, but it's a disgrace to stay there. You've got to keep coming back. We're all imperfect. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to fail. We can't quit because we make a mistake. Now, in something like you're speaking, uh, uh, a fall in the ice rink or something like that. Uh, that's it. You're, you're going you're gonna to lose, but you don't give up. You may lose the championship, but you still, you never lose in your heart if you know that you made the effort to do the best you're capable of doing. You made the effort. You, you're never going to do it, but you can always make the effort to do that. And uh, uh, I, I don't want, I don't, I never want players to fear failure. Now there are those who teach but they want them afraid to fail. I don't want them afraid to fail. I don't want them to feel that way. I know they're imperfect. They are going to fail on occasions, but that's to be positive. Let's look for the positive end of it all the time. And, and I, 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 that's what I tried to do. I, I wanted to be, be, be positive all the time. I don't expect them to win all the time. I don't expect them to make every shot in, in various things. I, I didn't want to be um, uh, uh, critical of sins of, of commission I would be critical of those of omission, where they're not thinking, not, not, not doing the things they should. But the commission, the doer makes mistakes. Uh, there's a chapter in Andy's book that says, uh, the one that makes the most, the team that makes the most mistakes will probably win. Well, you've got to take it with a little green of salt, but it's what it is, is my college coach taught me that, the doer makes mistakes. If you don't do anything, <laughs> well, that's the biggest mistake of all, really, but you, you don't make mistakes. If, if man never shoots, he <laughs> never, never missed a shot because he didn't take any. And uh, I never want him to be, a, I didn't want him to be afraid of failure. I want him to understand that on occasions they were, were going to fail. 
But like, uh, just take an example, as I mentioned, shooting. Don't force shots up there. Now, you see him forcing things in there. I didn't like that. I didn't like that. It must come within the framework uh, of what were the overall uh, philosophy that we have. Coach Chris, your thoughts. So, Coach Imp, I think that, you know, learning the lessons from mistakes, mistakes are powerful teachers. Learn the lesson, incorporate them into your thought processes and your behaviors, and then move on from there. Don't dwell on those mistakes. Move on and incorporate that lesson. So important in leadership. That's a great, that's a great, great point. And that's certainly the way that uh, Coach Wooden coached and I this takes us right to you're taking me right along it setting me up time after time the ultimate teammate you know I had a lady who was a general manager that I worked with was just a fantastic superstar and a perfectionist but it was this one quote that she got from John Wooden that took her over the top because she was really afraid to make mistakes uh and then because she was a perfectionist and a great one when she got this from Coach Wood and this quote, uh, it just, she went to a whole nother level. So, and then your job as a leader, you're supposed to you see something that's wrong, correct it when it happens on the spot, and then don't bring it up again. Don't bring it up the next day. People don't like that. Make it and move on, as Chris just pointed out. Coach Wood. And I can see how staying alert could help us do that. Now, how can we help our people develop that skill? One of the things that I stressed very, very much at practice in UCLA in the years that I taught basketball there was to be quick but never hurry. Now, you certainly have to be quick to spot something that uh, might be incorrect, and then you must learn to be quick to correct it. Now we're going to move on to the next block. Now that you got the initiative, you're taking the action. Coach Wooden says, oh, that's, no, <laughs> that's not enough. You're going to need intentness, which actually isn't even a word. Coach Wooden used to love to tell me. He just made it up. Uh, I'm not going to read the definition. You can see it up there in the top. How about if we have Coach Wooden tell us about intentness? Then we must be intent. I might have said be determined. I might have said persevere. I might have said persist. <laughs> But I happen to use the word intent, intent. Be intent on reaching realistic goals or objectives. Don't make your goals so um, idealistic that they're unattainable or before long they'll become, uh, they'll become evident and they'll become counterproductive. Don't make your goals easily achieved because things easily achieved are required. Usually aren't very meaningful and will be very lasting. Make them difficult within the realm of possibility and then don't let adversity keep you from going keeping on and keeping on someone said when i look back it seems to me all the grief that had to be left me when the pain was over stronger than i was before we get stronger through adversity no matter what it is there'll be obstacles you may have to change your method you may have to go around or under or over you may have to back up to start over but don't quit be intent on reaching the realistic objective coach chris so Craig, focus and identify the goals and don't let the noise get in the way of the goals. We all have noise. We have a lot of distractions on a day-to-day -day basis, but focusing on what steps are you taking to achieve your goals that day is so critically important to, to being, uh, to goal achievement, to success, and to a sense of satisfaction about what you're doing day in and day out. You know, you, you and Coach Wooden just compliment each other so well. He's giving us a generic statement, and then you're giving us the how-to. Focus. Don't get distracted by the noise. Now, this is one of my favorites. Set a realistic goal. If you set stretch goals that are unattainable, hoping to move people's performance up, it will be counterproductive. And you won't even know it as a leader because the salespeople aren't going to tell you this goal is garbage. I'm sorry, Coach Wooden, for saying that. But I <laughs> make them difficult but attainable. Coach, Chris, your, your comments on goal setting. So goals need to be smart. They need to be specific. 
They need to be measurable. They need to be achievable because as Coach Imp just shared, goals that are too aggressive are highly demotivating. They need to be realistic and they need to be timely. So set in time, when will they be achieved? And this framework can be very, very helpful in structuring goals and measuring progress against them. Now, Coach Chris, you bought this smart goal idea to the uh, right from you to the wooden class. And with your permission, I'm going to always use it moving forward if we don't happen to be working together. That's the best thing I've ever seen on goals, the smart goals. Fan. Fantastic. Now you can see the second part of the definition. We all can read it, concentrate on the achievement by resisting all temptations, being persistent. Let's talk about John Wooden and being persistent. Now, you all know that John Wooden was voted the greatest coach in the history of American sports, any sport, won 10 national championships in 12 years. You can see in that far right column where it says postseason in black at the top and down at the bottom, you see all these NC2A championships. Well, that column is the result of how we did in the championship tournament. But above it, you see a lot of blank spaces. So in John Wooden's first 17 years, he only got into the championship tournament five times. Couldn't win the big game, this Wooden guy. And his record when he got to play in the championship tournament was the worst in basketball with three wins and nine losses. And then he went on to win the 10 in 12 years. Uh, the record not even touched by anybody. So this is a great video clip. Uh, Coach Wooden first explains why he doesn't like to be called the Wizard of Westwood, which you'll get a kick out of that. But then he talks about those first 17 years at UCLA in the old gym, no home court to play on. Coach, go get him. On behalf of Team Wizard, happily named after you, uh, we're wondering what is the greatest team conflict that you had to overcome in your coaching career? Um, they're no wizard. I don't like that. They don't like that. Don't, don't, refer, to, don't refer to me as a wizard. Don't, don't. Uh, 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 lack of an adequate place to play. For my first 17 years at UCLA, we practiced in the old men's gym. You familiar with that? On the third floor, every day the manager and I mopped and swept the floor before practice. As we're having practice, a good part of the season, uh, Cease Hollingsworth, our gymnastics coach, is practicing his gymnastics team. A tumbler knocked me down one time. Got me the first time. <laughs> and down at the end of the floor, down to 4 a.m., Briggs Hunt, uh, his wrestlers are having that. And over on this side of the floor, as you come up, were two trampolines. And occasionally, on those trampolines, some of our coids would be up there. Some of our coids. Beautiful. In, in, I, I think so. In, in leotards. And here I am, and I noticed, my players noticed that. I didn't. <laughs> but for 17 years, we did that. And I'd say, uh, in every area, that was the most difficult thing we had. Those practice conditions, no privacy at all in uh, dressing rooms or shower rooms or anything of that sort. Pack up on the weekend, get together, go to Santa Monica City College, Venice High School, Pan Pacific Auditorium, Long Beach City College, Long Beach Auditorium, and other places to play home games. That's the most difficult thing we had to come, overcome. And I think in spite of the things that have been mentioned about the championships, the 88 in the world, and, and the uh, 88 win game in a row and the seventh championship. The most difficult thing was our first two championships, but those were the, those were the conditions in which we uh, had when we won our first two national championships. But from my point of view, and had I not signed the three-year contract when I came here, I'd have left after two years <laughs> because I, uh, I, I, I looked at the plans when I came here and this will be all done by your third year. We got it after 17 years. And uh, I had left, left, left. Let's say I, I had an opportunity to go back to my alma mater and a lot more money and a lot more everything. Uh, uh, but they reminded me that the, I was the one who insisted on a three-year contract. They only wanted to give me two, and I don't know why in the world I didn't go like but I didn't. <laughs> but I insisted on the three, so they kind of got to me, and I stayed the third year. And after that, I just stayed. Coach Chris, what do you think about that? 
So it is easy to be distracted, Craig, we all know that. And it's easy to be discouraged by imperfection, but leaders lead people through the imperfection, stay focused on the goals and help everybody to feel good about the progress that they're making. That's a great point. And you're building that, you're building that foundation as you're going, as you're going through that. And that, which takes us right to the next great idea when you go to accomplish something worthwhile, expect adversity. Coach Wood. Someone once said, uh, uh, this crowd on earth, they soon forget the heroes of the past. They cheer like mad until you fall. And that's how long you last. And that's so true. You can't depend on what you've done in the past. And for every peak, there's a valley. You must be very careful about that. Uh, I never wanted the peaks to be too high nor the valleys to be too low. Everyone, regardless of the position that they have, should be making the effort to do the very best that they're capable of doing at whatever that task is. You must work for constant improvement. Don't expect that to climb to the top all of a sudden. The road toward uh, the top is going to be difficult. There's going to be uh, adversity along the way. Second rule, complaining about the past dissipates our intentness. Coach Wooden, give us the details, please. Too often we complain about the past, make excuses for the past when things didn't go our way instead of analyzing it and trying to determine from what happened how we can prevent that from happening again. Now it's up to the person in position of leadership to make certain that those under his or her supervision understand that. Coach Chris, what's your perspective on that idea? Leaders speak respectfully about the past. They acknowledge realistically what the present is and they look optimistically to the future. Very, very consistently, they do those three things and set role models for their teams. You are so clear and concise. It is just an absolute pleasure to, to work with you. There's nothing I can add to that. Uh, the third thing that dissipates our persistence, determination, intentness is when we compare ourselves to other people. Coach, go for it. Some of our managers might look at a sizzler with a better location than theirs and wonder, even if they did their best, how could they ever outdo the other location? They should do the best with what they have and not compare with others. If they do the best they can at their location, they'll probably be given the opportunity to work at a better location. Of course, if they don't do their best, uh, they may not get the opportunity to work at any location. Coach, what are your thoughts on this idea of uh, comparing? You know, Coach Imp, the reality is that comparing ourselves to others is truly avoidance behavior. You wind up denying reality and then you miss opportunities to bring your team around a goal in a collaborative manner to truly achieve success that everybody shares in. You know, I love this phrase that you brought to the program, avoidance behavior. It's one that I'm gonna use in the, in the future and that avoidance behavior prevents you from coaching the most important you should be coaching, person you should be coaching and that's yourself. Your best effort requires both of these things, Coach Chris. It requires initiative and it requires intentness. Bill Gates, first business, Trafo data, the product didn't even work. He and Paul Allen went out of business on it. Stephen King, novelist who sold over 350 million books. First novel got rejected 30 times he threw it in the trash can. His wife went and got it out of the trash can and gave it to him and told him to go back to work. Jay-Z, huh. he could not get a record label to sign him. Not one, not one. So he started his own record label. Be a good UBS client, he's a billionaire. How about this fella? Vincent Van Gogh in his lifetime sold one picture but that did not stop him from painting 900 
how's your resolve? Steven Spielberg couldn't get into the film school that he dreamed of going to. USC rejected him twice, never admitted him. Well, now he's a trustee for the school. What a story J.K. Rowling and the founder of, 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 and writer of Harry Potter. When J.K. started Harry Potter, she was a single divorced mom on welfare, pushing her little baby around in a carriage. And then when the baby would fall asleep, she'd run into a deli and write some pages. The Potter Empire, not to use money as a measuring stick, but is now worth a little over $3 billion. You talk about initiative and intentness. Beethoven, at the height of his career, starts going deaf. So he takes the piano that he has, he cuts the legs down, he makes it close to the ground so he can hear the music. He can't hear the sounds, but he can feel the vibrations. It was under those conditions that he wrote Symphony Number no. 9. This fella, Howard Schultz, oh yeah, he went to work for a company called Starbucks. They fired him because they thought his idea of having espresso machines in a coffee shop was not practical. He went down the street, he started his own coffee shop, different name, obviously that worked. Then he came back and bought Starbucks from Starbucks. We know the rest. Sam Walton, well, before Walmart, he was milking cows and selling magazines. My favorite, Oprah Winfrey grew up to the age of six wearing skirts made out of potato sacks. She's molested by two members of her family and has to run away from home at the age of 13. At the age of 14, she loses her unborn child in birth. She moves back in with her mom, still not going well, gets it turned around. She goes to live with her dad, got a scholarship, won a beauty pageant, and was discovered by at a radio station. How about that for initiative and intentness? And our fella, John Wooden, coached 29 years before he won a national championship. A couple of questions here. I'm not going to read them out loud, but you can certainly answer them. This is a great quote from Napoleon Hill, keeping that idea that success might be just around the corner. So keep your intentness. Takeaways, principles are very simple. Initiative, don't be afraid. Take action right away. Don't wait on it. Intentness, obviously, expect adversity. Don't complain about the past. Don't compare. Three easy rules. My favorite, don't be a flavor of the month person. I shouldn't say so many, but many of the companies I've worked with, they get one program going, that doesn't work right away. And now they're going to go to, no, no, we're going to, now we're going to do this book. And that doesn't work in that quarter. Oh, the numbers are down a little bit. Oh, now we're going to go to this next program. And they're constantly changing. So they never dig in with initiative and intentness and do the work that's needed to build the foundation. Don't be a flavor of the month person. Think about Coach Wooden's first 17 years. So the real takeaway here is in the workbook that you get, I can't do this for you. If you're not doing this on your own, I, well, I think you're missing an opportunity. Here's habits that reflect initiative. A great thing to do is have the, your uh, team members do a 360 on you, on how you are in these habits, and you go ahead and you score yourself on them. And then after you score, you're going to pick out one that you want to like, uh, that you want to work on. And this is, a, this is big time. Don't Make the correction. Don't bring it up later. And I might add it to, I might add attitude. I might add, let your team members get some wins, Chris. You, every time somebody brings in a, oh, that's good, but I think we can do even better than that. Let them get some wins on their own. Just zip it and say, that's a great idea. That's how you're going to help them build initiative on their own. And now we've got these great quotes, uh, 88. Leader is a people builder. The leader creates initiative in others. You score it. Well, how do you create initiative in others? Our favorite Abraham Lincoln quote. Don't be an answer person. You got to let them roll on their own and make some mistakes. And that's how they build their foundation, their initiative. Habits on intents. Uh, man, just great. Uh, look at the bottom. ET, I don't compare myself to others. 
Uh, I welcome adversity. Anyway, just great, great things that you can think about. Uh, give yourself a score. I picked out this one. Make sure that you have a vision and a goal for your life beyond your bank account. What do you really want to get done? So when you're getting ready to take off, think about what you left on the planet to help other people out. And then I love this quote that I picked on this one. I think it's one of the greatest quotes you can use when you're introducing a new program. Too many times people introduce a new program and they say, oh, it's going to be the greatest thing ever. It's going to be the greatest client ever. Oh, this, this is going to be fantastic. And then it doesn't work and everybody's disappointed and they're walking around moaning. Introduce the program with the idea that, hey, this could be a great program. It could be a horrible program. But remember that all change may not be progress, but all progress is a result of change. And if you get your folks thinking like that, it becomes a mantra. And then they're eager and intent to really give that new program a chance to do well. For next month, pick a habit, pick a quote, work on it, get better. This month for our trivia question, we're giving away 10 laminated pyramids. A person whose name you know, but I don't believe that you know him. This is the best book I've ever read, bar none. A friend of mine turned me on to it about a, a month ago. It's called Up From Slavery. It was written in 1901. Chris, the autobiography of Booker T. Washington, the most persistent initiative American that I've ever witnessed. You're going to get a hard copy of this book in Laminated Pyramids. Here is the trivia question. This was in a slide, and I mentioned it twice. You're going to email Chris with your answer. In the first 17 years of coaching, what was John's record in the postseason tournament? You'll have to be on the live phone call to uh, find out. Remember, takeaways, tools, Woodham's, Woodham's, Woodham's Wisdom Leadership Library. There's 524 issues in there, searchable by topic. I just got on the fourth, fourth part of uh, Booker T. Washington. Password, UBS123. Woodham's Wisdom, if you haven't signed up, get with it. You're going to get a 60-page playbook in your email that documents everything that we did in this session today, along with some inspirational things that you can do with your team. And I am eager, full of intentness and initiative, ready to help you out. Next month, we're going to move on to the next two things Coach Wooden says we have to have, conditioning, mental, moral, and physical, and skill. And skill must be preceded by proper conditioning. So it's going to be very exciting. Chris, thanks for the opportunity. And back to you to wrap this up. Coach Jim, thank you so much for your continued astute observations and your insights into Wooden's wisdom. This, any, any part of this information that can be applied as you're working on your team as financial advisors, as you're growing your team, all of these concepts are additive. So identify one to two things that you want to implement on a consistent basis, work with your team to implement them and you will see forward progress and uh, uh, you know, will help you to achieve a higher level of success. Coach Imp, this information is so, so valuable and we really appreciate you sharing this with us. Thanks for having me. We're um, out of here. <laughs> all right, take care everybody. Bye. Thank you.